As a trauma survivor, I have always been interested in resilience. But growing up, I believed it was something that you were born with. Then in graduate school, I learned that it was a quality that we all possess and a set of skills we can all strengthen. Most of my resilience has come from writing and seeing myself in new ways by confronting the stories I've always told myself. The more I did that, the stronger I became, and I've dedicated my life to helping others do this work. This podcast is for anyone who wants to understand their story and how to revise it, because when we do that work, we change the world. Katie Rouse is a marketing manager, poet, and freelance writer who explores faith, doubt, and deconstruction. I met Katie in 2023 while she was taking my camp structure course. At the time, she was working to find the right structure for her memoir about deconstructing her faith while serving as a missionary in India. During our class, I watched her work come alive as I got to know more about her and her story. She's also published pieces in Miss of Mag, Hyssop and Laurel, and The Unmooring. To learn more about Katie and to subscribe to her newsletter, please see the show notes. Katie has just finished her structure draft. During the season-ending Ask Me Anything episode, we explore what it looks like to let a manuscript rest so your ideas can marinate before working on late-stage revisions. Before we get to our conversation, I have a few questions for you. How do you know it's time to let a manuscript rest? Do you resist doing it? What fears do you face? What have you done to cope with them? If you've let your manuscript rest, what tells you it's time to pick it back up? I hope you'll ponder these questions as you listen along. Now let's get to my interview with Katie Rouse. Hey writers, have you struggled to develop characters beyond a laundry list of physical traits, or do you fall into the tired cliches of stomachs that roil and boil, hearts that pound, and characters that look off into the distance, unsure what to do? Has a critique partner ever told you your character's motivations or actions don't make sense? Or worse, has an agent told you they just don't connect with your main character? Let's face it, developing great characters is hard work. It takes both artistry and an understanding of psychology to bring them to life and make their actions understandable. It's even harder when that character you're trying to describe is you. That's why I'm teaming up with Jane Friedman to teach the psychology of character development for memoirists on June 19th, 2024. During this 90-minute webinar, you'll discover the three-step chain of events that determines what your character does in any situation, investigate the role that core wounds, attachment styles, and inner resources play in shaping your character's personality, and find out how having your character act as if can help you limit backstory and start in the right place. Plus, you're going to learn so much more. Best of all, this webinar is only $25. You heard that right, $25. For that price, you can attend the live webinar, watch the recording, or do both, and get access to the webinar's workbook and my slides. So if you want to understand yourself better, write characters readers will fall in love with, and feel confident that you know how to do more than just craft tired cliches, go to janefreeman.com and click on paid classes, or make it easy on yourself and click on the link in the show notes. Well, hello there, Katie. I am so glad that you are here today on the podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Writing Your Resilience podcast. You have a question that you're going to ask. I do. Yeah. So tell me what you'd like me to know so that we can have a conversation that would be supportive to you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. I love this venture that you're on. and I love that I've been with you as a student for over a year now and been able to glean your resilience. And so this is the perfect podcast for you. So I am finishing up the story draft of my memoir. And my question is, how do I let go and rest after finishing this draft this week? And what might that rest look like for both as a writer Hmm. and as just a human and my well-being This is such a great question. I think for all writers, but especially if you're writing a tough story, because I'm just going to speak for myself as a trauma survivor, rest is a four letter word that I never, ever want to say. It is so Mm -hmm. hard because Mm -hmm. my nervous system is not wired for it. And so I don't want to read into your experience, but I do want to just say that we have to think about, yeah, rest in multiple ways. So Mm -hmm. Before we can rest, 
we have to create a sense of completion. So that's mm -hmm. job number one. And it helps if you know in advance what complete looks like. And if you're in the middle of a draft, like the story draft, that's just the draft where you're trying to figure out what is the story. It's not done yet, but you're just trying to get to what we would call the narrative arc. Finding the good enough completion point, the good enough resting point for yourself mm -hmm. is really important. And that's going to happen both in your body, right? There's going to be some sort of settling to say like, yes, this is complete. And you're going to have done enough work on the page to feel like you can let it go. Because, yeah. you know, this is the most important piece is like, not everything will get done. And I work with lots and lots of writers. They're like, shit, I've got all these extra comments and this other thing that I could do. And do I revise this one part of the draft? My answer is no, you don't have to do all of those things. When you think about your draft, where do you think you are and, and what does your completion point look like? Yeah, I'm definitely feeling that settling happening with, I know there's more. I know I've got to go deeper with one section. And I also know I'm not doing that now. I'm not doing that yet. And so I made a list for myself of like, here are a few scenes. I went through all the comments, all the notes. And I said, these are the scenes that keep popping up that people want to know. And so I've just done a little bit of work this week to get those scenes out. I have one or two more that I'm like, those are the ones I want to do. And then I have two or three more that I'm going to put on a different spreadsheet to do later. And that's bringing me that sense of complete completeness in my, in my soul of like, we've done enough, right? And we've done what we wanted to get done before we took this break. And the arc is there, you know where it needs to be tweaked and altered, but you don't have to do it now. That is beautiful. Which is really comforting. Yeah, so you've made a list in advance of the things that you're going to work on yep. later versus what you're gonna do mm -hmm. now. And I hear you talking to yourself in a certain way. Is there a mantra you use or a certain phrase that you say to yourself repeatedly to remind yourself that all you have to do is complete at a good enough level? Yeah, I think it's just, I am enough mm. or it, it's, I am enough. Not that the work has to be enough. Like yes. I, I've got it on my screen here. I am enough and everything I can and can't do will not change that. And Beautiful. that's what I have to hold on to. Because if I start making it about the to do's, I start to lose that sense of enoughness. But when, and I learned this from you, coming back to that good enough feeling inside myself, not necessarily on the sentence level of each yes. chapter or the scene level of each section, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We have to feel like we're enough and recognize that our drafts are in flux, they're evolving and that's okay. And you're doing this work beautifully. And that's step one, like what does completion look like? And then how do we do it? And then you have to complete. And I often yeah. say, one of the things you should do is create some sort of ritual. Mm -hmm. And that ritual could involve lighting a candle and, you know, listing all of the things that are accomplishments for this draft, all of the things that you want to say goodbye to. We had different rituals we did in our class, right? Where we had water that we had in a container and then we kept pouring it out to show the things mm -hmm. that we were filling up for, you know, what's to come. So I think having mm -hmm. some sort of ritual is helpful and having a concrete, tangible thing you can touch that is a measure of how far you've come. And so I often tell people, print out a copy of your manuscript, yeah. create, you know, you can even go to a local printer and create a bound copy, having mm -hmm. something that you can touch and feel. And that looks like a book, right? That's why I suggest mm -hmm. going to a printer that looks like a book, reinforces that sense of completion inside yourself. And, mm -hmm. you know, later on, when you come back to it, you've got this draft that you can open up and read front to back or back to front, whatever you want to do. But you have something that you can work on later that you can hold on to and put on your bookshelf. And I always say put it on your bookshelf because that yeah. signals to the brain and to the body that we're done. And so, you know, that's about completion. 
And then there's the rest. And when we think about rest, there are three areas that you want to work on. So you want to think about your mind, your body and your writing process. And that's important because your writing process has had a certain level of intensity, a certain rhythm to it, and you may change that. That doesn't mean you're not going to write, but there's things that you're going to do in a different way. So, you know, resting your body is going to look like just general good self care practices, getting enough sleep exercising and moving your body in whatever way feels good to you, being out in the sun to get that vitamin D, going in nature. And in fact, you may wanna take part of your writing uh, time, especially if you've been spending a lot of writing time on a manuscript, take part of that and just go walk in nature because mm -hmm. that's gonna serve not just your body, but also your mind and your, and your writing process because you're opening yourself up to possibilities. So I think that's one piece is resting the body. And then the next part is going to be resting the mind. And that can be really challenging when we when we first let something go, because there's going to be a part of us. that's like, but but does it but we got this idea, we got this or that. So one of the ways that you can do that and you've already started doing it beautifully is to create a spreadsheet or a notebook or some place where you put all of your ideas. Because I don't know why this happens, but as soon as you rest, all these ideas are going to flood you. They just will. That's the mm -hmm. way it works. But if you can just write those down and journal and do something else that can really help. And then you think about your process. And for some people, rest doesn't look like stillness. For some people, rest looks like I'm going to start working on another project because I know where I want to go next. And if I'm focusing on that, it allows this other thing that I was working on to marinate. So you could have another project, you could be journaling. So sometimes journaling is a great way to do that. Or you could, you know, try to come up with a bunch of writing exercises or writing prompts. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that, but you want to figure out how do you want to shift your writing practice in such a way that you're not losing your writing practice, your creativity is still there, but it looks different so that you don't have that intensity. So I'm going to stop there and ask you if you have any questions, because one of the other things that you asked in in my little interview that I have before we get started is, OK, and how do you know when to come back and what does that look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think about this yeah. issue of rest? Yeah, I think I had not thought about my writing process mm -hmm. as much as a place of rest. So I've thought about the books I want to read while I'm resting and mm -hmm. like using when I would normally kind of switch to my writing gears like using that time to go read but I do have another project and poetry projects that's just like spinning around in my brain and it's like okay yeah like shifting your practice to that but making it look different I think will be a nice challenge to figure out how to how to shift the gears in practice yeah yeah, and I love that you mentioned reading because I didn't even talk about that. I hadn't written it down as something to discuss, but yes, <laughs> reading is another way. You know, if you were doing right. a whole lot of writing and a whole lot of revising, you could just spend your writing time reading if you wanted to. And just, mm -hmm. you don't even have to read within your genre, just read for pleasure, right. whatever it is that fills yeah. you up. But I love this idea of having not just a different project, but a project in a different genre, because it's going to work right. different muscles. Because mm -hmm. the goal before you get back to your project is to have forgotten pretty much everything that you've done, right. which is easier than you think. Because when you forget, then you have a chance to come at it with fresh eyes. And you're going to mm -hmm. see so many things. And that is a way to self edit so that you don't necessarily have to rely on beta readers. I mean, you're gonna have a time when you want to, but you'd be surprised at how much you can get done on your own just from having rest. Right, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that leads to the last part of your question, which is how the hell do I know when it's time to come back? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are some general guidelines around you know, one to three months as a starting point just let it go for that period of time. And what I tell people is go ahead and put it in your calendar, put a reminder so that you come back to it. Don't just think like, okay, you know, one to three months, we're just going to forget about it for a while. No, put a start date back in your calendar and it's a tentative start date because what you might find is that when you get to that point, 
some part of you still says no it's not time mm-hmm. and that's happened to me before and and it's hard because for me i want to get started right away and mm-hmm. i've had times where my project had to marinate for six months or nine months mm-hmm. and one of the things you have to watch for in this part and this is one of the reasons why rest can be so terrifying to writers is the fear that if i let it go i'll never come back to it and it's going to be just one more thing that sits on my bookshelf or it sits in my computer or you know it's i'm just never going to i'm never going to get it done so when you think about this idea of rest are there any fears that are coming up where you're like oh yeah that's that's a pain point or a fear point for me that might make this difficult. Yeah, I think what comes up for me is the fear of coming back to it. And to say it in like the meanest part of my brain's voice, it's all wrong, mm. or I come back to it. And, and I think it's the worst. That's, that's the fear that comes up, that kind of harsh criticism. Part of me that's like, I'm ready to desolate this. And it's like, No, I don't want that. Yeah. And I think honoring that that is a common fear and a common thing that does happen because this has happened to me with every draft and i've talked to so many writers and they're like oh yeah that's what happens to me when you get back to your work whether it's the next draft or you're starting a new project there can be this panicky feeling like i don't know how to do this and so when we feel that fear of not knowing how then we become hypercritical because you know what fear does is fear creates control inside us. Fear is actually a a mechanism we use to, well, control is actually a mechanism of fear. But, you know, and one of the ways that we control is through criticism. Because if we criticize the work, then no one else can criticize it. It kind of serves as a shield. So begin to think now, what is the gentleness you can bring to that process? And know what your MO is, right? Because we all have our own ways of being critical. Write down what those triggers are for you and also what it looks like when you're being that way so that when it happens you can just be like ah there it is thank you Mm -hmm. and and then you can say you know is there a part of me that needs something is there a part of me that needs something to make this process safe because you know there's the process of getting back to it and also for some writers the shame of feeling like i'm not ready to do it and i feel like i should be able to and that's about the messages of the world because you know you're going to come to this next draft as all writers do and it may be a yes when it's time to come back or for others it might be not yet and for some people it's going to be maybe never or you know that you know inside that the length of time this is going to need to marinate is a long time. And that could be because whatever that question was that was wrestling, you were wrestling with, you know, initially has been answered, or it could just be that, you know, you know that the story is still continuing and there's more to life. There's more living that has to happen in order for this to be ready to be looked at again. Or it could just be that, you're not emotionally ready. And that's happened to me before where I just knew like things were going on in my life or shoot, it was summertime and I'm writing about being a survivor of suicide loss and I don't wanna go there in the middle of the summer when mm-hmm. I wanna be happy. So there's lots of different reasons why that can happen. You wanna honor that and know that it is something that many writers go through and it is okay. Yeah, that's comforting. Well, what would you like to say as we wrap up? Just thank you so much. I I think I needed to be reminded how common some of these questions and answers are, you know, and how, you know, we're not alone in the process of finding the things that are hard and are good and are, <laughs> you know, pain points and are celebration points. So it's really helpful. You are definitely not alone and you are definitely enough. And I can just say, because I have read many excerpts of your story that it is beautifully written and it is gonna serve so many people when it's ready. But most importantly, most importantly, I really hope it serves you in whatever way it's supposed to. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that. 
Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It is an honor to have you here. And, you know, I look forward to seeing where all of this goes. Thank you so much, Lisa. Are you a writer who struggles with doubts? Do you wonder if your stories are good enough? Do you wish you had some simple tricks that would make the writing life just a little bit easier? Become part of my Writing and Resilience community by signing up for my newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive a free copy of Write More, Fret Less, five brain hacks that will supercharge your productivity, creativity, and confidence. The link is in the show notes. That's it for today's episode. Before you leave, I would love your help spreading the word about this podcast. You can do this in a few very simple ways. Click on the subscribe button in the upper right-hand corner, then leave a five-star review. You can also let me know what you think or share ideas for the podcast by connecting with me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, or through my Writing Your Resilience newsletter, which you can have delivered directly to your inbox.